Welcome everyone, I'm Russell Alexander. I've been practicing law for more than 20 years with our team here at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. Thank you for joining us today. Without further ado, let's get into today's topic. What family judges can learn about pornography? For those who may not have heard the term before, deep fakes are images or videos that have been digitally altered to include very realistic but deceptive portrayals of celebrities or well-known individuals. As one example, a series of recent deep fakes appear on to show Tom Cruise magic tricks telling jokes uh, which were fake. Far more notoriously, they also found they're also found in pornography videos where celebrity faces are convincingly transplanted onto the bodies of porn stars using digital tools and artificial intelligence. Sorry, artificial intelligence. The result is that the actor effectively put into the sexual action without his or her consent. Technical technology and changes deep flakes are few steps up from the concept of email spoofing which involves creating an email message with a forged address for the sender, i.e. making it look like the email originated from a particular person when it did not. In whatever form, this type of tech-based deception is getting harder and harder to spot, especially with the advanced state of technology. And it's becoming more prevalent even outside the realms of pornography in Hollywood. Case in point, deep fakes and spoofing have even infiltrated the family court system in the form of fake evidence proffered to a judge, usually by a spouse or a parent in support of his or her position at trial or in a proceeding. The potential for misuse and misrepresentation was illustrated in a real recent custody battle over a two-year-old girl in a case called Shankar. The court began its judgment this way. Text messages, emails, and social media postings have become leading sources of evidence across a wide array of criminal, civil, and family disputes. Judges have before them the actual words and deeds of the parties written or posted in the party's own hand? Or do they? In an era of fake news, it should come as no surprise that from time to time, courts will be presented with fake evidence. Accessible technologies have made it easier than ever to generate or alter phone calls, texts, emails, social media accounts, photographs, and even experts' reports in a manner that disguises the origin and fakes or spoofs their intended purpose. On the fifth day of trial, the long-standing custody dispute in this case took a sharp turn when the mother, who was a citizen of India but a permanent resident in Canada, tendered a series of what the court called transparent and shocking forgeries that she said she had created. These included an altered paternity test, a for forged sperm donor agreement, a sham email exchange between the father and his counsel, which alleged the planning of a criminal act to remove the mother from the litigation. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're enjoying this video and find it helpful, you can give it a thumbs up or leave a comment for us below. The mother's rampant deception prompted her current lawyer, who was at least the last in a series of 11, to withdraw immediately. The mother advised the court she would be continuing as self-represented litigant. However, only 30 hours later, she hopped on a plane to India and did not even stop to say goodbye to the daughter for whom she was seeking custody. The court also heard evidence that the parents' brief three-month courtship 
as well as their volatile long distance marriage were peppered with confusing lies and controlling behavior by the mother. After untangling all the fake texts and emails, doctored audio, false testimony by imposter witnesses, and other discredited evidence tendered by the mother, the court readily granted custody to the father, who was a native of Oregon and was still living there. Then the judge at the end of the judgment spanning over 250 paragraphs, the court offered the following comments about the rise of digitally altered evidence of all types. <clears throat> the court's own role in weeding out forgeries. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some final thoughts as to the court transitions to a fully digital platform. This trial was a stark reminder of the potential for manipulation and misuse of electronic evidence. The most common internet definition of a spoofed email is when the email address is in the from field is not that of the sender. It's an easy to spot spoof email and not always so easy to detect. For sophisticated senders such as actors who are fishing for information of commercial value, the origins of spoof email may never be detected. Spoofing originates from the idea of a hoax or a parody. And in the early days of the internet, it was a legitimate tool for managing communications so that a user believed that an email came from one source when it actually came from another. Spoofing first arose as a term in family law, more commonly referred to in the US as divorce law, to describe cell phone users hiding their identity or location for nefarious purposes. As a result of advances in mobile apps, websites, forwarding, forwarding services, and other technologies, Callers are now able to change how their voice sounds to evade a block number or pretend to be a person or institution with whom their target was familiar. Targets can be tricked into disclosing sensitive information, harassed, stalked, and frightened. Any electronic medium can be spoofed. Texts, emails, postings to social media, even messaging through a reputable software program specifically de designed to provide secure communication between sparring parents. What stood out in this case was the purpose of the spoofed communications. Instead of tricking or scaring the target, electronic communications were spoofed to deliberately damage the other parent's credibility and to gain advantage in the litigation. The appeal for, there was inauthentic evidence that was tendered as bogus and a critical catch that was not always apparent. A party's lament that it was me, that it wasn't me, may appear credible at one stage of the proceeding, but no longer credible at a later stage. An email or text at first, at first reading appears to be authentic might later be found to be inauthentic when examined within the evidence as a whole. Fake evidence has the potential to open up a whole new battleground in high conflict family law litigation. And it poses specific challenges for courts. Generally, email and social media protocols have no internal mechanism for authentic authentication and the low threshold in the Evidence Act only requires that some direct or circumstantial that the thing be what it appears to be, as a quote from the Act, can make determinations highly contextual. In a digital landscape, spoofing is the new catch me if you can game of credibility. The court urges lawyers and family services providers and institutions to be on guard 
and part of the better way forward. The courts cannot do this important work alone, and the work must be done well. High conflict litigation not only damages kids and diminishes parents, it weakens society as a whole for generations to come. As technology gets more accessible and fake evidence gets easier to create, it may be tempting for family litigants to embark on a little digital wizardry of their own in a bid to bolster their case. But for those who might be tempted, the decision in Shankar serves as a stark warning. In a separate ruling, the Court of Appeals slapped the mother with an order requiring her to pay a whopping $438,000 in legal costs. You can learn more about this case and read our full article online at our main blog. Please leave your thoughts, comments, and questions in the comment box below. If you liked this video and found it helpful, please give us a thumbs up to let us know. You can subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to get notification every time we upload a new video. Thank you for watching.